There's probably no scene that people remember in Deliverance that's even remotely as powerful in their recollection as the squeal like a pig scene where Bobby is raped by one of the mountain men. And in the filming of Deliverance, everybody knew that scene was coming. And because it was filmed sequentially, there was a, a lot of tension building up to that scene. What in the hell are Lewis and Drew doing up there in the wet? Probably doing the same thing we are. The rape scene was, to me, it was kind of, in some ways, the heart of the film because it was the, you know, the rape of the river by the urban men and the rape of them by nature's revenge, if you like. If you consider the mountain men as being sort of the malignant spirit of the forest. Bobby? It was difficult, of course, but for me, the problem was the location, where to shoot it. And I looked and looked and looked, and eventually I found this place, which was laurels, which had these acid green leaves, so that the light coming through had that nasty kind of greenish hue to it. And there were these brown leaves from the laurels on these undulating slopes, and these black stems of the laurels, and nothing else. And once I found that, I knew really how to shoot it. This river don't go to entry. You done taken the wrong turn. Casting, first of all, man who played the toothless one, he worked on a dude ranch with uh, Bert Reynolds, and Bert told me about him. John said to me, I can't find the other guy. And I, you know, I've got lots of southern actors, but they won't take their front teeth out. And it's a plot point. I said, the actors are funny about that. They don't want to pull their front teeth. But I, I worked with a guy. And I used to do the stunt, a stunt show in Ghost Town, North Carolina. He had no front teeth. The guy's name was Cowboy Coward. Now, he stutters, but he was a hell of an actor. And he played Pa Clanton in the shootout, the OK Corral. And he said, you think you can find him? I said, I don't know. I said, I, I, this had been 15 years before, maybe more. So I called Ghost Town. I said, do you, do you possibly know where Cowboy Coward is? And they said, yeah, he's right here. So he came in, and he was amazing. He got a little pretty mouth, ain't he? The other guy, I saw a lot of people for that part. And obviously, it was very, very difficult. And he had an extraordinary quality. Bill McKinney, who was sensational in this part. So intimidating, so deranged, powerful physically, too. Unusual guy, very good guy, who was a, a tree surgeon from Los Angeles <laughs> as one of his jobs, an actor, a singer, and a tree surgeon. And he, they got him, somehow they got him for this part. Boy, you are lost, ain't you? Well, hell, I, I guess this river comes out somewhere, don't it? That's where we're going, somewhere. He and Ned Beatty spent a lot of time together because in a certain sense, when we approaching this scene, it, it sort of cut them off from everybody. There were these two and they had to do this and they had to find a way of doing it. Now let's you just drop them pants. Drop? Just take them right off. I, I mean, what's this all about? Don't say anything, just do it. It's just drop them, boy. Didn't bother me that much. It's all work to me. I'm pretty much a contemporary sexual person, you know. Um, but I didn't read that much sex into it. The scene wasn't going to be particularly physical the way it was written. But when we came up to start you know, getting ready to actually doing it, Mr. Borman said, uh, I, I just don't believe it. He said, I don't believe this guy's you know, going to drop his laundry and then just sort of give in to this. He said, I want you to run. I said, fine, I'll run. But Bill was great to work with, especially in that regard. The whole thing about running away and catching and everything. Interesting thing about it was, you know, even when I'm beating him up at the first of it, you know, after I throw him the knife in the tree and chase him up the hill and then pulling his underwear and slapping him, I'm thinking all the time about protecting him too. You know, so it's, it's, it's uh, interesting thinking back on it, those things that come to your mind. You know, although I'm, there's contempt there, but I'm still, I'm taking care of him. I'm not losing control. Ned is a great actor, and what Ned was able to do was to make it so convincing that he was being raped. That was what made the scene work so well. No! 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 
He played it. I mean, he, he allowed himself, as far as I can see, in his own mind and heart to be violated. It takes a lot of courage. <laughs> it takes a lot of courage for a man to do that. He's one hell of an actor. <laughs> I bet you can squeal. I bet you can squeal like a pig. Oh. Uh, squeal. Huh? Squeal down. Squeal. <laughs> squeal. Squeal. Squeal louder. Squeal. Squeal like a pig. The line itself came about because the need to do it for television, to a cleaned up version. You know, squeal like a pig was one of the things we came up with as being a kind of harmless thing that could be substituted for these F words. And it, it worked so well that I abandoned the F words and used that instead. And it was much more effective. Come on, squeal, squeal. <coughs> that whole scene is so frightening. And it was done in a way that was tastefully done, but it was horrifying at the same time. Because without doing this scene in a horrifying way, you would not believe the rest of the story. We've seen that scene, in a sense, uh, where a husband who's tied up and forced to watch his wife being raped, and here it's the man who's being raped, and he can do nothing about it. And the Burt Reynolds character, Lewis, of course, can. When he arrives, he's able to fulfill his destiny, which is to kill a man. Well, after Bill McKinney is shot, this debate goes on about what to do with him. And he has to play dead there. And this is extraordinary discipline, this man. Was, you know, he mustn't blink, he mustn't breathe. And he was able to do this as we shot this long sequence that went on around him. Death is like no responsibility, really. I spotted on that tree twice for six minutes and 45 seconds and I, without blinking, right? And this guy comes running in with a stopwatch. He said, Jesus, you remember, you know how long you stayed with your eyes open? I said, no. He said, 6.45. So we did it again, I did it again. But see, the atmosphere was right. It was a little bit on the moist side, humid, and there's no glare, and I'm on the tree, and I just keep it on the tree. Well, let's get our heads together. Come on now, let's not do anything foolish. Ned's performance was so devastating in that. And obviously that scene afterwards is my big scene in the film. This ain't one of your fucking games! You killed somebody! And preparing for that scene was the easiest thing in the world. I mean, I would just get myself out of breath just because we had supposed to have been running up. I mean, then that was easy. You could run in place or do push-ups or do whatever just to get yourself where you're actually heaving a little bit. And then right before the scene was done, I would just go over and hug Ned. I mean, all you gotta do is go look at his face. And, and, and emotionally, you're there. Well, now why couldn't he go get some other mountain men? Now why isn't he gonna do that? You look around you, Lewis. They've reached a kind of primal level here. They've killed someone. They're in this place, cut off from the world. As the Burt Reynolds character says, there's no law. The law? <laughs> the law? What law? And they decide to bury him and not tell anybody. Where's the law, Drew? And they carry him. Then there's a series of scenes then, which I did, where they carry this body on their, on their back so that it's redolent of some burial of some ancient chieftain. Then they have to claw out a grave with their hands. And Drew is the moralist who is completely against this idea that they should take the law into their own hands. You see him when they're digging the grave. First of all, he won't take part in it, and then he does, and he's sort of doing it feverishly. <coughs> and there's a sense that he's broken by this. What's the plan, Lewis? Just paddle on down to Hatry and get the cars and go home. John Borman came to me and he said, Ronnie, one of the, the really important things, and it's an important shot, is Drew's death. Put your life jacket on! He said, you can make it either way you want it to, but it's really important that you make his death be en enigmatic, that, that people not be clear one way or the other, but just make sure that it's, it's a mystery. Go ahead. 50% of the people I talk to think he bailed out. And probably Voigt thinks he killed himself, and because that's what 
his character would think and mine would think he was killed. I decided for my own purposes that Drew didn't get shot. He didn't commit suicide. He's too strong a Catholic to ever do that. But maybe his paddle hit a rock, spun him out. He hit his head on a rock. He drowned. But when they found the body, there was no bullet wound. There was no entry there. So as far as I'm concerned, he was not shot. So when they discover him, his body, he's washed up. And this arm is right across like this. And all, all we did was rub a little, make a little bruise under the armpit here. And it was an image of a man who's broken. I'm old now and I can't do it anymore. But I said, you know, John, I said, I can do a really weird thing with my shoulders. And he said, let me see it. So I showed him, and he, he almost fell down. He just thought it was the greatest thing he'd ever seen. And so, I mean, there, there are rages of people about whether that's prosthetic or how they did that. And it's just me. We shot more than a week in this little lagoon, which is in the bottom of the waterfall. And we could control the water, actually, on that waterfall. And we got permission from the water authorities that we could actually uh, control the water whenever we need it. So it was like being in a Universal Studios on a back lot. If they would have built a waterfall, it's, that's the way it would have looked like, actually, basically. For the smashing of the canoe, they were able to build a rail in so that the canoe was running along this rail, and uh, the, both canoes were on rail so that they were able to collide like that, and then the wooden canoe was, was rigged so it broke apart. And so having put all this in place with no water, then we would open the sluices, let the water come down, which covered the rails, and you see the two canoes collide and break up. <laughs> and then we had the men having to slide down this terrible slope. And it was the one place where we use a, a, a double for a point. <laughs> Bert wanted to do it himself. Bert said, I don't want to have to tell people that there was a, a stuntman. I did my own stuff. He sent a dummy over, and it looked awful. And I said to him, I can do that, John. And he went, you can do that? I said, yeah. So he said, all right. And then we got to the bottom. There was the scene there where Bert breaks his leg and he's dragged up. Well, that was just a, a lamb bone. I took the bone and broke it backwards, and then tore a hole in the stuff, the bone, and stuck it out and poured the blood on it. And uh, John, as only John would do, went, so it's good. Everybody else went, oh my. I mean, it was just, because it was like diabolique, you know, it was, it was uh, petrifying. <laughs> Here, here. Hold him here. Well, when Bert, of course, breaks his leg, then Voigt has to become Bert, take on the role, and find within himself this hunter, this primal man. And he has to climb this rock face, this cliff. And there's a certain point where he's, he's scared and he doesn't know if he can do it. And he takes out the picture of his wife and his son, and it drops. and it falls into this abyss. You never get out of this gorgeous life! God damn it! And it's like as though at that point he, he lost his family, lost everything that he, he was. And he goes on as this man who has become someone else. From being this gentle, easygoing guy, he's now become this killer. <laughs> 